This is the moment when you realise that although you're sitting next to all of the books that you're about to haul, there's probably at least another 10 on your Kindle. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Hi guys, it's Leanne and I am, yep, you guessed it, still sick and still in my living room. Aren't you just super pleased about the change of scenery? I know I am. But you read the title right, I am indeed here today to bring you a book haul. It has been a while, it's been since before Christmas, so some of the books in this haul may actually be Christmas gifts. Who knows? They're now in a completely unwieldy pile next to me and I'm just gonna have to just work through them. <laughs> there really are genuinely quite a lot of Kindle and audiobooks as well so I'm thinking maybe I'll split this into two parts and in this part we'll just do the physical freaking things here and then the next part we'll do the rest. I don't know. You'll know. You'll know. Is this a part one? And so onwards. The first book that I've got here is of course book five in the Wayward Children series and that is Come Tumbling Down by Seanan Maguire. I very very recently caught up with this series and read In An Absent Dream and I'm not gonna lie I am a huge stan for this series. I love it very very freaking much but in an absent dream was not what I expected. I gave it three stars. It definitely didn't hit the lofty heights of the others. So I have a great amount of hope for Come Tumbling Down. The Wayward Children series, in case you have been living under some sort of urban fantasy type rock for the last couple of years, is quite simply put about Eleanor West's home for wayward children, which is a school a little bit like Xavier's school in the X-Men, which plucks up special children who need Eleanor West's particular brand of help. These children have found the doorways to their portal fantasy world, think Alice down the rabbit hole and Dorothy with her twister to Oz, and the world is, is great, it's the best world for them, and for whatever reason they've been kicked out and they find themselves unceremoniously back in the real world and she shows them how to cope with that. It follows one of my favourite characters after a massive plot twist happened and I am... Mm -hmm. The next book is also a continuation of a series that I am oh so much in love with. I read this very month the Diviners by Libba Bray. I know I am massively behind on the bandwagon but I loved it. It got me out of a weird reading slump that's honestly been going on for the past six months where I just didn't feel like any time I read a book that was an actual physical like standard bookish print that I was finding myself transported by it. I wasn't finding myself hooked and page turning. In fact, I hadn't felt like that, quite honestly, since I discovered the Lockwood books and I was waiting for my next fix and oh, The Diviners is just so incredibly it. The Diviners, quite simply put, is an urban fantasy. Some people call it paranormal, but there are no werewolves or vampires or anything thus far, so I, it's urban fantasy, guys. It's historical, it is set in the 1920s and it follows Evie who has used her particular talent that she has discovered for touching objects and finding out people's secrets as a parlour trick at a party and she reveals a massive society scandal and so she is unceremoniously packed off to New York to live with her uncle who runs a museum for the occult in America and she is oh so very sad in her desperate want to be a flapper ways that she has been sent to New York but when she gets there murders start to happen and she decides to use her particular set of talents to investigate those murders. There is a lot of representation both racial and economic divides and LGBTQIA++++ there is just there's so much diversity in these books 
it is impossible to explain how much. And so just as I was finishing The Diviners, I picked up Lair of Dreams, which is the second book in the series. These are all huge books. They're all like between 550 and 600 pages and I don't freaking care. I have been reading them so, so quickly. I'm reading this one now. I'm not sorry about it. Prepare yourselves for seeing a lot of this series over the next little while because the fourth book just came out in February. It just, it just, it just the series finished in February. So I feel like I'm picking them up at the right time. The next two that I have here are books that I guarantee you, none of you were expecting me to pick up and talk about, but I do like to be unpredictable. And those are volumes one and two of Heartstopper by Alice Oseman. This is a graphic novel series. And before I go any further, I'ma tell you right now, for those of you who like me, don't necessarily like to spend money on graphic novel series, not because we don't love them, not because we're not amazingly there for the art, but because they are so freaking expensive. You can read this entire series for free online. I will link you guys below. Don't say I don't do anything for you. Alice Oseman originally set this up as a Tumblr comic and she was posting parts of it live. It was amazing. This is quite simply a YA romance about two boys who meet in school. It's set in the UK which makes me oh so happy because there is just not enough of this kind of stuff set in the UK in our high schools instead of American high schools and so when I discovered that this one included one of the kids being a rugby player I was just I was like just so freaking good. So essentially Nick and Charlie are at the same school but they have never met they are not in each other's social spheres and then one day they get put in the same kind of registration class together and they start talking. They have almost nothing in common or at least that's what they think. The next one that I've got is a memoir and I am so, so very excited to pick it up. It is a memoir about alcohol and giving up alcohol and I haven't read a memoir that deals specifically just with that. So this is Nothing Good Can Come From This by Kirsty Coulter. I felt like I had to actually read that because for some reason right now nothing is sticking in my brain. I found out about this book from the amazing Audrey Chapter and Converse and if you haven't checked out her channel yet you absolutely need to. I will link it below. She is just so engaging and so honest about what she enjoys in her books and I just, she makes me very happy. If you like my honesty, you're gonna like hers. And she was talking about how she's never thought about some of the stuff that actually came up in this book. So for context, I am someone who voluntarily almost never drinks. In fact, I could easily be teetotal. It would make no difference to my life. And so for me, it becomes kind of like a, an exercise in fitting in with the people around me who are also having alcohol, which is something that this book addresses. And what I really like about this is the little blurb. It says, when Kirsty Coulter stopped drinking, she started noticing things, like how a decades long feeling of dread and fatigue was really a constant low grade hangover, or that when you abruptly give up a debilitating habit, it leaves a gaping hole. And I'm like, <laughs> Girl, relatable. The next book that I have is also a memoir and this one is one that again hits quite close to home. So this is Inheritance, a memoir of genealogy, paternity and love by Danny Shapiro. And this is essentially Danny's experience of finding out quite accidentally through one of these um, find out your genealogy tests that have become so popular right now that her father is not actually her biological father. But unfortunately, when Danny finds this out, her parents have already passed away. And so she finds that she has absolutely no, nobody, just nobody who can unravel that mystery for her. And so she starts to do some investigating of her own. And what she finds out literally crumbles her entire life and everything that she knew about herself around her ears. Now, I am somebody who is adopted and I was adopted when I was a very small baby with no memories or anything like that of my birth mother. And so I was lucky enough that my parents 
uh, brought me up with the knowledge as in I, I never remember being told that I was adopted, I've just always known and I was, I, I've always considered myself really lucky that that's not an experience that I ever had to go through. However, when I got into my 20s, I did get very curious about my birth mother and so went back and found out a lot about her and her circumstances. And I cannot imagine having already a narrative of where you came from in your head and never thinking that there might be a mystery or other people involved and then suddenly having all of that dumped on top of you. So I am very, very excited to read this one. Okay, so these next three books are kind of a, a, a little um, Chris Riddle haul. <laughs> you guys know how I feel about Chris Riddle and his illustrations. He is definitely one of my favourite illustrators in the entire world. And so for Christmas, I got a few Chris Riddle books that I didn't already have. And this is a new one. This is The Guardians of Magic, which is the Cloud Horse Chronicles book one. And this is another one of his stories that are definitely middle grade but have a lot in them geared towards adults. In his goth girl series he really takes a pot shot at 18th and 19th century literature. He has so many characters that are only going to be recognisable to adults who have read the likes of Dickens and George Eliot and you know, a few other more questionable books involving like castles and creepy rooms and stuff. And in this series it looks like he's taking a few shots over the bow at traditional fantasy. So this is a world, a fantasy world, wherein fairy tales don't behave. So they do not run the course of the traditional fairy tales that we see in our world and likes of the Brothers Grimm. And in this world magic has been deemed dangerous because it's ruining people's lives. And so a lot of people are trying to find a way to make magic go away forever. And that is where the Guardians of Magic come in. And next up I have Poems to Live Your Life By which is a collection which is chosen and curated by Chris Riddle and obviously also illustrated. Not that long ago I hauled Poems to Love By I think was what it was called and that was a wonderful present from the guys at Pan Macmillan. It's just mmm, it's sumptuous and gorgeous and so I asked for the first one in this series. As always there's a really broad offering in these books so we've got everything from Shakespeare and Byron up to Chris Riddle himself and we've got people like Simon Armitage and Kate Tempest. There's Neil Gaiman, there's Lewis Carroll, there's even some Seamus Heaney in here which I wasn't just expecting at all. There's double page spreads like this where um, he has doodled around the poems and then there are tiny illustrations on some of the pages like this one on I Miss You which just... <laughs> but I'm very excited to dip into this. I really like collected poetry. I feel like it gives you an insight into the person who collected it and also a little bit of a break from one consistent style all the way through a collection so very excited for this one. And the last Chris Riddle book that I've got is not really a Chris Riddle book, it's technically a Neil Gaiman book. It is Art Matters because your imagination can change the world. I have been looking at this one for a really long time. So it turns out that Neil Gaiman's prose style and I, we just don't really get along. His fiction's not something I enjoy. I have tried three of his books and I'm just, I'm not into them. I don't like his characters. I don't like his writing style. However, I do of course like Good Omens which Neil Gaiman wrote with Terry Pratchett. I love that book a lot and so I was kind of like I wonder what his non-fiction style will be like and it turns out from dipping into this one that I actually really like it. However this book itself is again a beautiful object because it comes from the mind of Chris Riddle. The next three books that I've got is actually the first three books in a series and they were sent to me by the publisher because they know that I like crime and thriller series but that I'm really not into traditional detective narratives anymore and so this one <laughs> just seemed right up my alley. The first one is Dark Pines by Will Dean. So this one is kind of Scandi Noir meets something a little bit darker and it's about Tuva and I hope I'm saying 
her name correctly, Tuva Moodyson, who is a deaf investigative reporter and essentially bodies that start showing up in a very small woody community and when I say woody I mean forests and when I say forests I mean it's a Leanne book and Tuva goes and starts investigating but does not find things that she is comfortable with. I've also been told by the publisher that there is LGBTQIA plus 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 representation in these books and that makes me incredibly happy because there needs to be more representation and diversity in the crime fiction that is coming out right now. I feel like it's one of those genres that is really struggling to get with the times and I feel like that's because a lot of the already established big crime series out there are essentially about straight white average men <laughs> who fit within you know the gender binary and stuff. But I have Dark Pines and then I have Red Snow and then the latest one which I'm really excited about the cover for as well is Black River. The covers for these are just, it's like somebody said find a Leanne cover and somebody else went Next up I have another memoir and this one is definitely for anybody who really loved a false report or anybody who really loved the fact of a body I think. This one is Eggshell Skull by Bri Lee. This one was published I think in 2018 in Australia and has just sort of you know started to filter its way into the rest of the world because we behind the times with Australian book show. This is about Bri Lee who herself came from a small community wherein her dad was a pretty well respected cop and she grew up with a pretty strict moral code. When she went to university she decided that she was going to work in the court system, that she wanted to help to defend some of the people that she heard her dad talking about her entire life. And so she goes to work at the Queensland District Court and she sees there a lot of domestic abuse and she sees a lot of rape charges and she sees that a lot of those don't go through the system because the people, the complainants, do not always have the abilities or the intellectual skills to get themselves heard and so their cases often either just get lost somewhere in judiciary or they never uh, get actual convictions at the end and are unfortunately dismissed. And then Bri herself is sexually assaulted and she comes back to the exact court where she saw all of those cases happen as the complainant in her own case. But she is there with a lot of privilege and resources that the previous women that she had watched go through this system do not have and she is determined that she is going to make her mark on the system and her case is going to be heard and she's going to make a change and that is essentially what this memoir is about. The next one that I've got here is also a memoir and it's also a memoir about sexual assault. This is things we didn't talk about when I was a girl, victim, survivor, friend by Jeannie Vanesco. So essentially Jeannie Vanesco when she was in her teens had a really really positive relationship with a male friend. They were very close, they were best friends, they did everything together and before college their relationship ended one night when he raped her and years and years later Jeannie has done nothing about this, she's let this experience go to a certain extent and then things start to come up for her. The Me Too movement happens and she starts to get some sort of flashbacks and feelings about what happened again and she decides to do something that is completely out of the box and she contacts the guy who raped her, her ex-friend, and she asks if she can interview him for this book. So this book is Jeannie's memories and her memoirs interspersed with the interviews that she did with her rapist to try and understand the experience from both his point of view and from hers. And I have read the first again section or so of this book and it completely killed me. It completely blew me away. I'm going to be doing a buddy read of this one with the wonderful Simone from me, Simone and I. You know, I love Simone to pieces and I think everybody should be watching her channel. Mm -hmm, just everybody. She deserves many more subscribers than she has. And 
we're going to do a buddy read of this one at some point during this year so hold on to your hats for that one. Next I have a true crime book. This is The Murders at White House Farm, Jeremy Bamber and the Killing of His Family by Carol Ann Lee. This one has been very recently adapted into a three part ITV drama by the same name. And I'm not sure if that's because there's a particular anniversary or event that has sparked this off. But this was a very, very famous murder in the 80s in the UK and England. And essentially, Jeremy Bamber one day uh, rang the police and said, my dad has called. He says that my mum is going absolutely insane and that she has a gun. And when the police got to the house, they found his mother dead with the shotgun next to her and a Bible. His father also killed and his, I think, two younger brothers and a sister, if I'm remembering right. All of these people killed and he considered himself to have basically got away with it. And then to the media's shock, <laughs> to the UK's shock, he was then arrested for the murder and very, very quickly afterwards, within a year, he was convicted of all of the murders and is serving life and has always maintained his innocence. So it sounds like from just briefly uh, perusing this one that Carol Ann Lee has somehow got access to some documents that haven't been published so far, that haven't been spoken about and uh, this is sort of her tell-all about exactly what happened with access to the family that nobody has ever had before. So I am really looking forward to reading this one. And last but not least, I have this one. This is Darius the Great is Not Okay by Adib Coram and I am mm, so excited. There is a follow-up to this one which has just been released and I just, I have all the feelings all of the feelings. I've been thinking throughout this whole video how I was going to sum this one up and do you know what I'm not even going to bother I'm just going to read you some of the blurb because it was what really sold me on it. So Darius Kellner speaks better Klingon than Farsi I mean same and he knows more about Hobbit social cues than Persian ones. He's a fractional Persian half his mum's side and his first ever trip to Iran is about to change his life. Darian has never really fit in at home and he's sure things are going to be the same in Iran. His clinical depression doesn't exactly help matters and trying to explain his medication to his grandparents only makes things harder. Then Darius meets Sorab, the boy next door and everything changes. Soon they're spending their days together playing soccer, eating faludi and talking for hours on a secret rooftop overlooking the city skyline. Sorab calls him Darush the original Farsi version of his name and Darius has never felt more like himself than he does now that he's Darush to Sarab. By turns hilarious and heartbreaking, Adib Koram's brilliant novel is for anyone who's ever felt not good enough then met a friend who makes them feel so much more than okay. And I mean, doesn't the world just need this novel right now? I am really, really excited to read this one. I think it's going to be a game changer so this one will be on a TBR very soon. And that's everything! That is all of the things that, okay it's not all of the things, it's only a fraction of the things, it's a small amount of the things that I have purchased recently. My Kindle and my Audible are just burgeoning with new books that I'm going to tell you about in another part. So I guess you know now, I guess this is definitely part one to a two-part thing. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. I will be back at some point with all of the things that I have bought that are not actual physical copies and I will tell you about them then. In the meantime, if you guys have read any of the books that I've hauled here today and you have loved them, please tell me about it in the comments, especially if that means that, you know, I bump them further up my TBR. And if you have been inspired to pick up any of these books, let me know, especially if it's a series that I've talked about, because I always like knowing that I've talked people into series. We're aware of this. Okay, I'm going to go now and ask my lovely wife Helen to help me take all of these books upstairs because I don't think I can carry them again. <laughs> Bye. Oh, bugger, I forgot that one. Next time.